So today's webinar is titled Tackling Leadership Challenges. And Chip, uh, Chip Huth is going to be our panelist or our main uh, highlight today. Chip, why don't you go ahead and turn on your camera here. Chip has spent Chip spent decades with the Kansas City, Missouri Police Department. Sorry, Missouri, Chip. I want to make sure I pronounce that in the way that's most acceptable to you. Long career in leadership in Kansas City and is joining us from Kansas City today. Now is with Arbinger full time. So I'm fortunate to get to call Chip my colleague. How are you doing today, Chip? I'm doing great, sir. It's such a joy to be here with everyone. Thank you so much. I really appreciate the opportunity. Yeah, so glad to have you. Always glad to have you. Always a pleasure pleasure to chat. Um, as I mentioned, this is a little bit different style of webinar. There's not a PowerPoint to share. We don't have lots of you know pre pre written layout presentation style as we often do with webinars, which are great. But we decided to take the opportunity with Chip to uh, to get to talk to you more about a lot of your leadership experience because you do have a lot of leadership experience. So this is more of a Q&A style. We got, I don't know how many questions. Last count, it was something over 600 questions from people all around the world and different levels of leadership. Obviously we cannot answer all of those questions. I wish we could, but we cannot. So Chip and I have done our best to winnow those down into kind of the, the core questions. What's really interesting, and Chip, I'm sure you have your own thoughts on this, but what's really interesting is despite the fact that there were hundreds and hundreds, a lot of them still boiled down to the same core questions. Doesn't really matter where you are from, where you are in your organization. A lot of people just have the same challenges. They face the same questions. And so I hope we've picked the best ones. Yeah, sir, I got to say, uh, you know, essentially all problems boil down to people problems. I think that's why we're seeing that commonality. Um, you know, it's it's people that show up late to work. It's people that fail to meet expectations. It's people that collude and people that need to be developed and, and be trained. So I, I think that, I, that in my impression, that's why we're seeing that uh, that common theme running through those hundreds of questions. I want to be clear, too, for everybody. We are not totally going into this blind. I've got a whole list of questions. Chip, I know that you made some notes. Uh, there is no way we're going to be able to get through all of these. So hopefully we're able to get through as many as possible. Those that we can't get through, Chip and I were just chat chatting this morning, and I know he's got a ton of traveling coming up. But once he's back, even for a window, we're going to try and hop on LinkedIn Live and answer some more of these questions. So if you don't follow Arbinger on LinkedIn, or if you're not connected with Chip yet, Follow Arbinger, connect with Chip so that you're sure not to miss that opportunity to hear even more from Chip. Also, for all of you joining and all of you who've registered, you will get a copy of this recording when it's done. Okay, Chip. I love this question. So this is tackling leadership challenges. The first question right out of the gate, we had a ton of people ask, what are your biggest leadership challenges? Yeah, that's that's a good question because I have many. Um, I think probably one of my biggest ones is um, I have a tendency to focus kind of uh, or, or force my approach uh, for coaching uh, into all situations. Like maybe I have preferred methods that I use. Uh, and so like I have a bias for those kind of time tested techniques. Uh, when I force them into new contexts, it kind of clouds my ability to see the whole picture. And I can't uncover like specific impediments that this particular person might be experiencing. So like I might have a particular coaching strategy that I like or prefer, uh, maybe because that leverages my style uh, of communication. And then I'm rushing to judgment so I can get after fixing the problem versus actually, you know, kind of diagnosing. Uh, so an example that would be um, I really like uh, I really like asking these Socratic questions when I'm training. I think it's a powerful method to help lead people to discover uh, for themselves, the knowledge that they need, but it doesn't work for everyone. Uh, and just because I like it uh, doesn't mean it's the best approach. Uh, Dan Schmier, one of my mentors, told me one time, you know, Chip, when you're teaching or training or developing, you have to bait the hook with what the fish likes, not with what you like. So one thing that I, I'm challenged with is obviously that, right? I want to go to my go to my quiver and pull out the arrows that I'm most comfortable using. Um, another challenge for me is communication. Um, I, I really still have this tendency, and I work on it all the time, to listen with the intent to respond, 
uh, rather than the intent to understand the person. Uh, so when I'm inward, at my most inward, I'm very uncomfortable with these natural pauses that occur in conversation, uh, those long silences. I feel the need to fill the void. And the reason I think that is, is because I don't want the other person to perceive that I don't have all the answers, right? So there's nothing more inward than that. I'm, I'm, I'm wanting to project this image of myself as being the, you know, the one that can solve all the problems. Um, another kind of effect of seeing myself as a leader with all the answers is I can tend to overtask myself. I take on too much. I'm kind of burning the candle at both ends. And then, you know, when, what ends up happening is that's a that's a form of self-objectification. And when I do that, I fail to honor I have natural limitations like everyone else. Then I don't take time to recharge. I don't take time to go on a hike, maybe, or spend time with loved ones. Um, and essentially what I do is I just exceed my bandwidth. So those are just a couple of my leadership challenges. We could probably spend the rest of our time together talking about my challenge. So I should also point out. Chip, you have construction going on upstairs. So if anybody can hear periodically, you may hear some very loud noises coming from Chip's end. Little unscheduled demolition. Uh, you unscheduled. Know, no, no plan survives first contact, as it were. Next question, Chip. This is another really common one. Uh, I don't mean I know these weren't ranked in order of how many times they were asked but they kind of were collated that way. And this was another one we probably got two dozen times, which is what do you do when most team members are on board with the vision for the team, but you have one team member or a couple of team members who resist and won't fully commit? Yeah, that is a good question. I got to tell you, um, I've had experience with this. Uh, I had an employee on a team that I was sent in to kind of rehab and um, I got so in my own head. I wanted to be seen by my boss as the leader that could fix this team. And there was one team member that just refused to get on board. Uh, no matter what I did, every technique I tried, um, every approach I tried, they pretty much just crossed their arms and, and just, you know, they, they refused, right? They weren't going to do it. And um, I was, I mean, th this is a strong word. Maybe I'll get into this a little bit more later, but I, I was a complete coward around it, honestly. Um, I thought like if, if, I, if I honored this team member's decision, to not get on board, then that was going to make me look like a failed leader. Like if I lost anybody on the team, I, I felt I, I put myself in the place of being responsible for everyone's success. And the reality of it is when you're outward, when, when we're outward, we realize that's not true. Um, this team member had a problem, but it was their problem. And I was trying to solve their problem, which is just another way of objectifying people, right? I was seeing that employee as a means to an end uh, to make me again, look like that leader that could fix everything. So, you know, the answer to that question is simply this. Uh, the people that we're leading, they get a vote. They have agency. They're a person, just like I'm a person. And sometimes they will choose for reasons that they may or may not share to not get on board, to not actually come together as part of a team. And, you know, you have to address that. And, and the way you address that is simply honoring their agency. Um, you simply just say, okay, if you're not willing to do the things that we need you to do to be an effective team member, it doesn't make you a bad person. It just means you can't be on the team. Um, and I'm not saying that for leaders to take that as an excuse to rush to that. I mean, we have to do our work, make sure we've trained, prepared, and equipped that person to take on that responsibility. But once we know we have, and they still won't do it, we have to honor their choice. And, uh, you know, I like the example of a fish tank, the analogy. My friend, Michael Lazan, he loves my analogies. So uh, I, I like this analogy of a fish tank. You know, you take a fish tank full of uh, 50 gallons of the purest, clearest water you can find, and you take one eyedropper full of toxic sewage, and you drop a drop in that fish tank, and you see what happens. And that's a pretty good analogy of what can happen when you retain a toxic employee who just refuse to, to, refuse to actually get on board. So uh, the last thing I'll say about that is people will respond, uh, for better or worse, like they're watching you and they're, they, they literally judge you by how you respond to the most challenging members of your team. And I think that's because they can identify with those people, even if they don't agree with them. Uh, so we have to be really careful with this. So honor their agency, let them make their choice, and then um, you know, let them experience the consequences of the choice. Well, we had, like I said, questions from all over, different roles, different industries. So an interesting flavor on this that you wanted to talk about was how do you how do I deal with students who are not interested in school? Just kind of a different flavor of that of a similar question. 
Yeah, and you know, full disclosure, uh, Sarah, I'm I'm not a teacher, and and I I have great respect for teachers, so I'm speaking a bit as a layperson here. Um, I am a leader, and teachers are leaders in the in the in the greatest sense of the word. Um, so in my experience, how do we get students more interested? Well, we become more interested in students. I know that sounds so simple, but I think this is illustrated by by my experience. Um, as you know, I was a bit of an autodidact growing up. You know, I hid out in libraries because my dad didn't like books. Um, but I had a real uh, high level of resentment for formal education, and and that that was demonstrated in how I sh showed up in school. I was the class clown. I was disengaged. I was always getting in trouble and sent to the principal's office. And back then, they actually swatted us with paddles. So, um, you know, I, I got quite the workout uh, as I was growing up, uh, bouncing from school to school. Um, but so my senior year in high school, there was a teacher, my government teacher. Her name was Brenda Witter. And Brenda Witter took such an interest in me. You know, her response to me when I was being recalcitrant uh, was to, to, you know, so typically like when, when something's broken, like at home, uh, you know, we get closer so we can examine it. But with people, we tend to pull away, which is a really odd dynamic. Brenda got closer. You know, she got to know me. She got interested in me. You know, she asked me questions. She wanted to know my background. And, and, and she literally inspired me. She, she never said, I need more from you. Not, not straight up, right? But she inspired me to do more and to lean into my work. I didn't want to let her down. And uh, I was able to, you know, get an A in that class. And, uh, you know, it was such a really, I, I can't even explain to people what it meant to me, but I will tell you this. Uh, January 5th, 1988, I graduate high school. Brenda Witter approaches me and she thanks me for being in her class. And she gives me this Bible with my name engraved on it. Uh, Brenda was a, a Christian woman, and she said, uh, you know, I, I just thought of you, Chip, and I thought you might want this, uh, you know, want, want this gift, and I really appreciate you as a student, and I have carried that Bible with me all around the world, uh, and I have it on my bookshelf today, and again, that's just the power, all right, to all you teachers out there, I want to encourage you, the power of seeing people, the power of seeing your students and inviting them, you know, to be their best self, so. So what do you do? When you get frustrated. Yeah, you got to own it. Like, that's all about you. That's not about the situation. You know, in Hellenistic philosophy, uh, they have something called the Stoic Fork. And so this idea that, you know, the world can be bifurcated into kind of two, two, two experiences. There's, there's things that I have control over and things I have no control over. And, and what the Stoics would suggest is you want to focus, you know, on the things you have control over. Um, then you can effectively respond. You know, we tend to get worried about a lot of things. Maybe I'm planning a picnic and then it rains. And, you know, there's nothing I can do about that. But I might spend a lot of my time worrying about it, which actually undermines my ability to respond to it. So understanding first that my frustration, that's actually what's, what that is. That's an indication that I'm abdicating my responsibility for my emotions. You know, so I'm shifting the responsibility for my decision to over-identify with my feelings onto other people uh, or on other circumstances. Uh, so I, I think when I get frustrated, the question I try to ask is, what image of myself right now is being threatened? Uh, what am I defending? And uh, is that feeling, if that feeling is honest, that feeling that I'm having is honest, uh, why does it need defending? Uh, so just owning that, owning that sense of frustration and realizing that that's about me, uh, I'm projecting it onto the situation, as evidenced by other people in the same context won't experience frustration. So that's an indication to me that that's subjective. So again, it might seem like, Chip, that's a simple answer to a complex problem, but just know by owning our, our, our emotions and our feelings, then we have power over them. Give me an example. Give me an example of how this played out for you in real life. Yeah. So, so again, with team members, right? So I can go back to a, a team member that will remain unnamed. And, and I remember coaching them and it's like, they just weren't picking up what I was putting down. And, and what, I started to feel that frustration. And then I realized, you know what I'm doing? I'm actually blaming this person for not being able to understand the things I'm trying to convey versus trying other approaches versus stepping up and just saying, look, okay, if this isn't working, like work down the pyramid. I'm teaching and communicating, teaching and communicating. It's not working. Well, what are the chances more teaching and communicating is the answer? Maybe I haven't properly diagnosed before I prescribe. So dropping back down that pyramid and really listening. Uh, got us where we needed to be. I understood actually this person was lacking the acumen for this particular position. Uh, they didn't want to say it. Um, I didn't want to believe it, but that was true. And we got to that finally. What we were able to do was to get them into a different position where they could contribute more effectively. 
that uh, I think that leads nicely into our next question. So if we look at the other side of this, right? If I'm the employee or if I'm the I'm the person reporting to you, Chip, and I start to feel like a number, what do I do? What do you do as a leader when your team members, when the people you manage, when your your team start to feel like numbers? Yeah. So, so I think the best thing to do is clarify your thinking around it. Um, you know, I, I feel like sometimes my mind, I've got like three or four internet browsers open at the same time and I'm bouncing all around, right? Uh, I, I think clarifying your thinking on the issue and Arbinger has a great tool that I love uh, called Who Feels Objectified. That's a tool that we use to systematically think through this, right? So we'll, we'll ask like a, the first part of the tool, we ask the question, you know, who on my team might feel like they're not being seen, might feel like they're being objectified. And then what have I done? to actually contribute to that view that they're having. And then what's what's one thing I can do to actually start to change that? And so by helping, it disciplines my thinking through the problem and I identify one thing I can do, again, to come out and, uh, and to invite them to see things differently. Um, and, and the other thing is, you know, I wanna help them understand their contribution they make to the mission. Everybody on your team contributes in some way, everyone from the maintenance person to the CEO. And and we and and we and I'm not in any way by by using those two extremes suggesting one's more important than the other. Their contributions are just different. And and our job in, as leadership is to help them see it, help them understand how critical their work is to making this whole thing go around. Because they lose sight of it. It's easy, especially if they're feeling objectified, to think, man, I'm showing up and no one would care if I didn't show up tomorrow. Um, a big part of leadership is helping them uncover, you know, the meaning that they're adding to uh, to to the mission. Uh, so that's another thing that I that I would recommend. But what if they don't trust you? What if yeah. they don't trust you? How do you build that trust? Yeah, slowly, like you know, slowly one contact at a time. Uh, you know, never underestimate the power. I think James Clear calls it the aggregation of marginal gains. Never underestimate that power of that one percent improvement, especially when it comes to trust. So I don't know of any shortcut when it comes to growing trust. Um, I like General McChrystal's metaphor of a garden. You know, uh, gardens uh, are governed by natural principles. You can plant the seeds and you can water the soil. Um, you can tend to the garden, but ultimately that garden grows according to natural principles that you really don't affect directly. Um, and it's the same way with trusting relationships. You plant the seeds, you make the investments, but slow is fast with people and fast is slow with people. And you have to honor that principle. You can't get around it. Uh, you know, you just simply can't surge trust. You have to build it long before you need to leverage it. And again, there's an opportunity in every single contact. Every touch you have with a person is an opportunity to build or destroy a relationship. And if you look at it that way and you prize it that way, oh my, I mean, there's just no limit to what you'll be able to accomplish if you're willing to be tactically patient. Um, you know, I, I wear a little bracelet around my uh, wrist here that says every interaction matters. And that's just a reminder to me that every time I'm meeting with a person, I have that opportunity. Um, and I, I wouldn't want to, I, I guess I'd be remiss if I said that, you know, you're a person too, you know, you're in this equation. So making and keeping promises to yourself is kind of like a first step. Like if you can't make and keep commitments to yourself, you're going to be unlikely to consistently honor your commitments to other people. I know that sounds kind of kind of paradoxical, but it's true. Um, you know, you're a person, you deserve respect, you deserve kindness. You know, I think you want to treat yourself like you would treat someone you care deeply for. Um, and, and that's the first step to being able to build that kind of trust that those employees need, those team members need uh, to be able to engage fully. How important is that concept in law enforcement? Well, I think it's critically important when you think about it. Um, and the thing I love about law enforcement is that law enforcement, and look, this is going to sound a little bit poetic, but I believe that the folks in law enforcement, the sworn officers and the professional staff folks, and all the support teams, uh, they have the ability to change the world. We talk about turning the world outward. I think there's nobody better positioned in law enforcement to lead that charge. Law enforcement and the people that work in law enforcement touch every strata of society from the richest to the poorest, and usually in contexts that are tense, uncertain, and rapidly evolving. And you know, people make a mistake of thinking, well, when we're in situations like that where safety is threatened, we can't build relationship. That's not true, right? Sometimes we have to work down the pyramid, as you hear me talk about, uh, but ultimately we have that opportunity and law enforcement, man, it's so, it's so rich with opportunities to do just that. And oh, why is it important to your point? Uh, well, again, we're dealing with situations that could be 
life endangering or life altering. And, you know, people think sometimes, well, you know, the life and death stuff in law enforcement, statistically, um, it probably is the you know, maybe 5% of the total contacts. Um, you know, it gets a lot of attention because it's so, so high profile. But, but, but the other contacts, they're important too. I mean, the kids that were helping to remove from dangerous situations, the, the people that were contacting to give directions to, you know, the community groups that we're speaking with, it goes on and on and on. Uh, team members within the organization that we can inspire. So, you know, th there's nothing that can be done uh, in law enforcement that doesn't require, you know, almost demand a high degree of trust. Great, great follow-up question, Sarah. So you're talking about building trust, building this team, building some cohesion. How does that work? How does the leader build that close, that unified team when we're teleworking, when we're all meeting from our, you know, bedrooms and closets and offices around the world, we don't have the luxury of all coming together all the time. Yeah, and that's still a thing too. We're kind of, uh, I don't know if that's ever going away totally. As, as we're doing right now. Yeah, as we're doing right now. Um, and while it's neat, we're able to reach people all around the world. Um, I do think, I think you have to acknowledge that there's limitations. I, I just think we're social creatures and being together, something about being together that invites a level of collaboration that I, I just don't know how to duplicate, um, you know, at a distance. But I, I want to encourage folks too. I don't think we should use that lack of proximity as kind of an excuse for not pursuing connection. I think we can do it. So, and what occurs to me is, you know, we have to double down on communication. Uh, and, and radical inclusion, I think that's essential in decision-making processes. Be totally transparent with everything you can be transparent about. Tell them what you're thinking. And if you can't tell them, then tell them why you can't tell them. Uh, you know, and so consistent sharing of strategic considerations. Uh, whenever we're shifting focus, we want to talk about that. That seems important to me. Um, take advantage of technology. So we want to use that to the fullest extent. Uh, if I've got a choice between teleconference or video conference, I want to choose video conference. And I want to kind of have a, a policy that we keep our cameras on um, so that we're actually engaging with one another. Um, I thought about like creating shared documents that team members can edit remotely as they collaborate. So we can actually work on the same documents and, and have inputs, uh, you know, using things like this chat feature to talk back and forth. Uh, you know, I think that's important too. Um, pair people up with other team members. So conduct meet to learns with other members of the team uh, and then have- What does that mean? That's some insider Arbinger speak, conduct a meet to learn. Good point. That's a, that's a tool that we have, meet to learn. And really it, it, to be most, to get at most directly, the only objective of that tool is to learn as much as I can about what we call the other person's outside triangles. What that means is, what is this other person trying to accomplish? What are their objectives? What are their goals? And, and so we learn as much as we can through this, again, meet to learn tool. And the purpose of these tools is to discipline our thinking. So we're not taking kind of a shotgun approach. We're really focused and intent. Um, so we do those meet to learns and have those periodic, periodic offline chats. It all shouldn't be about work, by the way. Um, I think we should also like maybe rotate partners uh, quarterly. We should share some personal information, pictures of the family, hobbies, music that we like, et cetera. Uh, perhaps we can highlight a, a team member each week, invite them to share some of those interests with the group, uh, you know, at large. So the thing is, it just, for me, it's easier to objectify people when there's a distance between them. Uh, but it, the more I know about you, Sarah, the harder it is for me to harbor these ir irrational feelings toward you. So learning about people, I think is really important. So a couple tips that come to mind, again, I'm not an expert in that area, but like everyone else, we've had to contend with it a bit. So. The next question I have here, Chip, this is a two-part question. Um, sometimes I think we conflate the outward mindset or seeing people as people. Uh, again, outward mindset is maybe an insider arbinger term. So if you don't know what that means, come to one of our trainings or read our book, The Outward Mindset, and get more insight into that. But I think there's a, a misunderstanding sometimes that outward means soft. And you are a longtime police officer. You've got a ton of experience. You've written a book about the situations that I could never understand being in. Uh, so I think you, more than a lot of people, really understand how being outward or seeing people as people is not exclusively a soft skill. So that brings me to the next question, which is a really common one that didn't come in just for this webinar, although we got a lot for this webinar. But in general, when we get questions of our facilitators into our website, on our social media, where have you, how do I discipline or terminate an employee 
with an outward mindset? Yeah, what a great question. Uh, the same way you onboard and train them with an outward mindset. It's, it's no different, right? It's part of the employee's life cycle. So as a leader, your primary job is to grow and develop each team member in their capacity to take responsibility. Like that's your job as a leader. That's the primary thing you do. How can we help them contribute in the most meaningful way to the organization? So the more responsible a team member can be, the more they can contribute. Uh, it's not your job to hold them accountable. Like if we, if we thought like, I've got to hold this person accountable, what I'm really doing is robbing them of their agency. It's actually my job as a leader to train, prepare, and equip them to be accountable. I want employees that are contributing even when I'm on vacation, even when I'm on an offsite. I don't want to have to stand over people, right? I want to inspire them to, again, own their work. Um, it's also my job to help them understand the natural consequences of violating their employment agreement. So, you know, if you get a team member who chooses to engage in conduct that undermines the organization's capacity to get results, what you do is you simply honor that choice. And the way you honor that is by permitting them to experience the predetermined natural consequences of their decision, up to and including helping them separate from the organization if you need to. So to fail to do so would be, it'd be like to limit the, uh, the, the offending team member's ability to take responsibility. You'd be hampering them actually, doing them no favors. So there's no growth when you do that. You cannot help an employee grow. And remember, your primary job as a leader is to help the employee grow. Why? Well, because that contributes to the production capability. And so you've got to be doing that all the time. Um, and, and it's just, you know, it, it, what, it, what ends up happening is your entire organization, it's populated with people that matter just as much as that offending team member matters. So how, how I fail to discipline or retain a chronic rule breaker without dishonoring every other person on the team? What message am I sending if I've got someone that's actually uh, failing to meet expectations and willfully engaging in misconduct, I don't address it. So what I'm doing is I'm, I'm dishonoring the person of everybody else on the team for the sake of what? Well, generally when I fail to do that, it's my ego. So just, just to wrap this up, you, as you can tell, I could, I could probably just go on for the rest of the time here talking about that one or answering that one question. But to wrap that up, we want to honor the entire person to include their full range of capacities. And when they step outside of what is expected of them, we have to take it on. But taking it on means seeing them as a person, a person who's capable of doing more, a person who's capable of accepting more responsibility. Like they're capable of that. To not have that accountability, to not supply that accountability, to not supply it for themselves in that scenario would, would be to totally undermine their potential. So, so it's so counterintuitive. So uh, that's a lot. I'm sorry, but that's, that's where I'm at on uh -huh. I don't, considering how many people ask this question, I don't think it's too much or a lot at all. Um, you talked a lot about firing somebody who breaks the rules, uh, who's difficult to work with, who's not doing their job, who's not keeping their employment agreement. Isn't it inward? This is an interesting question. Isn't it inward to fire someone who is kind, who gets along with everyone, who tries their best, but just can't meet expectations? Yeah, that is such a great question, right? I think I think that question is rooted in our uh, our natural uh, tendency to confuse being outward with being nice. Uh, which you know, again, if you come to the workshops or you receive coaching from one of our brilliant coaches, anybody on Tim True's team, uh, you're going to learn that that's just that is such a common misunderstanding, but it is a misunderstanding. Actually, retaining an employee who's incapable of, of achieving that minimal level of performance—that's one of the most inward things a leader can do. Um, if I'm doing that, that's all about me. It's not about them. Perhaps I don't want to be seen as a mean boss. You know, I don't want to do something uh, I see as unkind to this to this nice person. Uh, you know, if that's the case, the under the underperforming employee, uh, they're just a, a vehicle, and I just use them to reinforce that self image of myself. So, you know, under the guise of being a nice person, I objectify myself. I objectify the struggling team member, and I objectify every other person in the organization who's relying on that team member to actually honor their employment obligation. So firing people sucks. I mean, there's no doubt about it. Uh, you know, feeling sad for the employee that you're having to let go, um, that does not make you inward. Negative feelings are not the same as blaming feelings. You know, I can feel grief over this. Firing people is something that you have to be really good at, but you should never enjoy it. Uh, many, I would say many organizations have people who are allowed to suffer in a job for which they are ill-suited. Uh, and that's really due to management's cowardice, to be honest with you. You know, there, there comes that word again, cowardice. I know it seems like a strong word. Uh, you know, my friend Gus Lee, he taught me 
that you know the opposite of fear uh, is not courage, or the opposite of courage is not fear. Uh, you know, fear is simply an emotion that courage overcomes. The opposite of courage is indifference, which means I simply don't care enough to do the right thing for that for that other person. So when I'm outward, I'm able to care for people. Uh, and when I care for people, I'm able to able to act courageously. Uh, I might feel bad for anyone. I mean, I I feel extremely sad for anyone that's been allowed to languish in mediocrity for an entire career. At the same time, probably incurring the derision of coworkers and managers alike, uh, all because a self-focused leader, like the kind of self-focused leader I've been in the past, uh, you know, I was avoiding something I found distasteful. So, you know, bottom line, in the course of our employment, uh, we will occasionally be asked to do something we find personally objectionable, especially as a leader. That's why we're compensated, Sarah. If you, if, you, if you cash your paycheck and what's being asked of you is not illegal, immoral, unethical, or unsafe, uh, you're obligated to do it. Uh, and, you know, it's like John Candy said, you know, the moose should have told you out in front. Organizations do not pay leaders extra to undermine the organization. And I don't mean to be glib. This, this is a serious question, has serious implications. But in my experience, you can't lead those you don't see as people. And see them as people, it sometimes means that we have to give them what they need, not what they appear to want. So, again, I at the risk of ranting, I'm going to wrap that up. Well, let's look at the opposite side of that. Major question that we're dealing with across all industries. And I know we had actually a lot of government um, government employees ask this specifically. This was one that came up a lot from that, that kind of broad swath, if we're going to call that an industry, is retention. Mm. Talk to us, Chip. How do I retain people? People are leaving, especially younger generations, leaving at absolute record rates. What do we do about that? How, how is a leader to cope with that? Yeah, so look, there's a lot of tactical considerations, and I've seen all kinds of things being tried at that level. I'm going to step back a little bit and take more of a 30,000-foot view. I think recruitment and retention, uh, those are two sides of the same coin. I mean, the, the, the broad answer is this. If we work to create a culture that no one wants to leave, both problems are solved. Or they're at least effectively addressed. If I create a culture where people feel seen and valued, um, they're going to become my recruiters. And, and the other thing a culture like that does is it repels people who want to do less than their best, who want to kind of hide uh, in the mix where there's a lack of accountability, and it attracts people who want to be accountable and, and take high levels of responsibility. So again, Create that culture. And we can't go into exactly what that looks like. It begins with seeing each person and valuing them deeply and valuing their ability to contribute and developing and growing them, right? Um, that's the first thing. And then you start creating that culture. When that happens, again, these problems are taking care of themselves. The other thing I said to somebody the other day, kind of an offline conversation is, we were talking about, like in law enforcement, we were talking about this, this inability to retain and recruit people, this the perceived inability. Um, this, you know, we're, we're just understaffed. Everybody's doing, you know, more with less. And I said, look, if I took over a department today, I would be confident that I could cut the staffing in half. If half, if those half of those, if, if the half that, that we retain were willing to lean fully into the mission with an outward mindset and, 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 and be willing to work intently, uh, we, you know, we, number one, it wouldn't be long before we started attracting more like-minded people, but we could get the work done. Uh, and so that's kind of the first thing I'm thinking. And then the other thing is, um, this is tactical. Do exit evaluations and actually pay attention to them. I know in a lot of uh, companies, exit evaluations are kind of perfunctory. We have to really analyze these things and, and separate the wheat from the chaff. You're going to get some subjectivity, especially if the employee leaves under less than ideal circumstances. You have to be able to filter through that. And what you're looking for is patterns. Are we seeing a pattern uh, or of cultural issues that are being cited? Are we seeing a pattern of maybe cliquish behavior that is disincentivizing certain employees? Um, are we seeing a pattern of, of abuse from management? Most people don't leave jobs, they leave bosses. That's just true. So look at those exit evals, take them very seriously, invest in analyzing those and seeing what changes can be made. The benefit of doing that is not only do you alter things that are perhaps repelling people, uh, that, that want to be accountable and responsible, uh, but you also send the message to the people that are on the team that stay that you're taking this stuff seriously and you're willing to take it on. What about for those who feel like they don't have 
opportunities to grow. There are limited positions that they could advance into. I know that this is something that you've addressed a lot in your career. How does a leader approach that situation? Yeah, again, again another great question. Um, so again, we we uh, we have to be very clear. I think uh, for opportunities uh, for vertical and lateral mobility during the hiring process. So you're interviewing this prospective employee, but you know they're interviewing you too. And they're going to make an investment of their time into this company, which is their most important commodity. And so we want to honor that investment. We want to make sure they get the best return that they can on it. And so, you know, this arrangement's got to work both ways. We can be very clear about what constitutes success in their role so that they know what they're, uh, what they aim at, you know. And, and if there's limited opportunities in terms of position or roles, they should know that. They should know it up front and they can make an informed decision about if they want, whether or not they want to pursue a career. And, and, you know, with that particular organization. Conversely, there might be a few opportunities to assume like other roles or responsibilities, but we can always help people find, help people find ways to grow within their roles by investing in education, skill development. Um, you know, I think, I think the half-life on technical knowledge in the current operating environment is something like five to seven years, which basically means if I do nothing to develop myself, within five to seven years, I'll be halfway to irrelevant in my role. So even if we can't move up vertically, we can have, help people grow within their roles and make deeper, more fundamental contributions to the organization. Um, I think that's huge. And then you know, we've got to help each team member, again, uncover the meaning in their work. I go back to that all the time, constantly help them see this is what others are able to do because of what you're doing. And we got to keep that in their windshield and all different tactics and techniques leaders can use to do that. But that's got to be something that we're constantly committed to. So how do you address resistance? I know we talked about this a little bit earlier, but now you've talked more and more about the different skills and approaches and techniques, uh, none of them being shorthand, all of them take work. So as a leader, when you're dealing with employees who resist change, how do you deal with that? Yeah, I mean, I, I think in my experience, there's only two things people don't like, um, the way things are and change. You know, they're okay with everything else. Uh, I, and I think that's, you know, I think we resist change intuitively. Uh, you know, I just think we fear it. Uh, obviously, we're always trying to get back to the status quo, I think, at least at a, at a, at a non-conscious level. But, you know, I think it's just human nature. So, but the, here's the paradox there. We're always changing. Whether we resist it or not, we're always changing. We're either getting better or we're getting worse. I think it was Heraclides that said, I'll paraphrase, um, no person steps into the same river twice because they're not the same person. And it's not the same river. So one way to kind of help head off uh, some of this resistance is to constantly communicate the impermanence of policies and procedures. Um, you know, I think a lot of times people see a policy and they're thinking, okay, this is just the way it's always going to be. Um, but reality of it is, no, it's not. Things are going to change. Like we talk about the importance of decisiveness and leadership, and we shouldn't, you know, give short shrift to that. It is important. But I don't think we should underappreciate the power of being tentative. Like it is okay for me to be very clear that the problem we're challenging that we're attempting to address with a current way of working or operating or current policy, uh, you know, let folks know that, you know, as the operating environment shifts and challenges evolve, we're going to have to modify our approach accordingly. So nothing's permanent, uh, very few things at least, right? So, so that's just the nature of complexity. If we want people to be punctual, we've got to reinforce the importance of punctuality. We've got to tie it to mission success. Well, if we want people to be adaptable, we have, to, we have to reinforce the importance of adaptability. We have to constantly communicate how much we value adaptability as a trait, and we've got to reward it and celebrate it. When we see examples of people being adaptable and flexible, we, we hold them up, right, as, as kind of uh, exemplars. So, you know, you, you, you get, you're going to get what you, you know, whatever you're reinforcing, that's what you're going to get more of. That's the idea. Uh, so if I'm constantly worried or concerned about changes or I'm complaining down, you know, I, I'm, I'm over identifying again with my emotions and becoming frustrated. Well, then that's the signal the employees are going to get, the team are going to get for me. They're going to take that and run with it. Whereas if I, if, if I reinforce the importance of being able to be flexible, I'm going to get more flexibility. So that's, that's one thing that I'm thinking about in regard to this idea of, of resisting change. Chip, one thing you've talked about, I don't know how many times, uh, not just on this webinar, but over the years now that I've known you is the importance of listening and listening as a leader. We know it's important. What does that really mean? Uh, so 
I'll go tactical here for a minute. Uh, I mentioned I mentioned up top that you know I struggle with this, and I've been practicing it intently for about the last 13 years. Uh, th this is a lifelong pursuit. This is like working out. You don't go to the gym, get in shape, and then quit going to the gym. Uh, and and th this is how important this discipline is. You have to stay in it. You have to stay focused on it. Um, so just from a tactical consideration, like one of the first things I think about when I'm at my best, my most outward, and I'm actually listening, um, you know, I listen without judgment or disapproval. And I mean, nonverbal or verbal. I don't want to send any kind of indication that I'm disapproving of what the person's saying. I want to com be completely neutral in that to like give them the freedom to share openly, right? Um, I wanna listen without offering unsolicited advice. That's so tough. You know, uh, you know pe people like, in my relationships, there's a subtle thing people will do. It's very subtle when they want my opinion. If I'm not paying attention, I'll miss it. What they'll do is they'll, uh, they'll ask for it. And, and that's my cue, right? Uh, if I really feel like some advice is important, I could gently prompt you know, at a point of silence, I could say something like, you know, would you be willing to let me share my experience? Would you be willing to let me share something that's been helpful to me? I could ask that question. So I'm actually gaining permission to interject what I'm thinking. But you want to use that very carefully. Um, the other thing is you want to demonstrate, you know, authenticity. Some people call it empathy. Um, there's, there's nothing wrong with empathy, empathy, Sarah, but there's a dark side to it. I prefer to think more like be compassionate. So compassion is more than empathy. It takes it a step further. Compassion is a strong desire to relieve suffering. And, you know, suffering is inherent in every human interaction mm -hmm. in some way. It's baked in. It's kind of the price we pay for existence, in a sense. A lot of the world, a little bit of us, we're going to suffer to some degree. So, so being compassionate when I'm listening, right? Uh, not just empathic. Um, I, I don't know. I should, probably, I should probably clean that up a little bit when I say dark side of empathy. One example would be, so I was homeless as a kid for a time. Uh, when I see homeless folks, sometimes my indication is to just give them money and then to walk away. And what that does for me is that makes me feel good. Like I feel like, well, I've done something. But the reality of it is without knowing the context for that particular person, I might have made their situation worse. Right. I may have just enabled them doing enabled them in behavior that's really bad for them. Whereas maybe a compassionate response for me requires mm -hmm. a little bit more work, but I could go down to maybe the Costco and buy, you know, a couple of you know, cases of toilet paper and donate it to the Salvation Army or to a mission or to, to some charity that helps homeless people. So the, so I want to be really clear about that. We could do a whole talk on the idea of empathy, but but again, we, we can over-identify with, with negative emotions. We can over-identify with positive emotions or things generally considered positive. So go with compassion. Uh, and so uh, the other thing I guess would be like, keep focused uh, when you're listening on the other person's experiences. Don't hijack the story. Uh, it is so tempting because we want to relate to, to someone that when they're sharing something with us, we'll jump in and kind of piggyback on their story. When I'm inward, I'll like, oh, you got an uncle that, that suffered from cancer. I got an uncle that suffered from cancer. And the next thing you know, we're talking about us. We want to really stay focused on that person and their experience and resist that temptation to just kind of jump in and hijack the story. Where, give me some examples, Chip. Where has this, uh, how did you learn this lesson? Where has it gone wrong for you? And then yeah. how have you applied these concepts and where has it gone right? Yeah, so as far as learning, you know, I, I, I still try to be an avid reader. Um, you know, a lot of what I've learned, I've learned through reading. And then my experiences, uh, obviously with teammates like yourself, Sarah. So Arbinger taught me the lesson about being out, about seeing and valuing people. And when I value people, I'm interested and curious in their stories. I'm less likely to jump in and hijack. I'm less likely to judge because I'm just, oh, there's this overpowering curiosity I have. I want to know what is driving this person, right? And then from a tactical standpoint, there's all kinds of, of, of good tactical advice out there. You just got to be careful because with tactical advice, if you approach it with the wrong mindset, any communication system can be undermined. Um, but I, I know Carl Rogers, uh, eminent, eminent uh, psychotherapist. Uh, he wrote a book called um, On Becoming a Person, I believe is the title of the book, On Becoming a Person. And he outlines his personal, like kind of his person-centered therapy um, approach. While we're not therapists, we can extract a lot out of that. Uh, you know, this idea that in that conversation, in that therapy, he centered it around the person rather than techniques or tactics. And, and so that's another great kind of resource, if you will. 
Um, so yeah, that's that for me, that's kind of where that some of that thinking comes from. You've talked a lot and just now talked about learning the concepts of outward mindset and seeing people as people. How do you teach it? How do you turn around and teach it to your team? Easy. You model it. <laughs> I remember uh, Andy Kyle. Andy's probably not listening. He's probably working really hard today. Andy Kyle was my assistant team leader in the SWAT team when I started implementing some of these ideas. And, uh, you know, I remember, man, I, oh, I went about it. I fell on my face like, I don't know how many times. Like, I went about it so wrong. I was trying to prescribe it to people. I was trying to tell them, you know, we need to do less of this and more of that. And Andy catches me in my office one day, closes the door. And I love Andy. He's a former Marine. Whenever he closes the door, you know you're about to get some critical feedback. So he closes the door. And he says, Chip, I see clearly what you're trying to do. He says, quit telling them and show them. Quit telling them and show them. And it, something clicked when he said that. So we want to literally help people feel seen. If people are feeling objectified at work, they're feeling put upon and used, you can expect them to show up in helpful ways with your customers, internal or external. Um, you know, they, if they're objectified, they're seen as a means to an end, guess what? They're going to transfer that onto the customer. They're going to transfer that on other team members. They're going to objectify them just the same. So the best way to teach it, and this is tried and true, right, is to simply model it. You know, be the change you want to see in the team. Show, I promise you, people are really good at picking up on this. And this, just like toxicity is contagious, this is contagious. When they feel seen, that when they feel honored as a full person, they're going to want to start operating that way. I promise you, I've seen it happen, you know, I don't know how many times now, but again, no easy button. If someone tells you there's an easy solution to this, you should run away as fast as you can. The fact of the matter is uh, being a leader is really hard. You got to work at it a lot. That's why we have a dearth of really real quality leadership in my, in my personal opinion, out there in all, all of our domains, because it's hard work. Like you wouldn't think, well, you, you know, I'm going to become a surgeon and I'm just going to go ahead and, you know, uh, you know, rush through that or not take the time to study, learn and develop, or you're going to become a mechanic and you're mm -hmm. just going to, you know, I can take a, a two hour course and I'm going to be a mechanic. Those professions require hard work as do all professions. So does being a leader. So I have to work really hard at it. I have to learn, develop, grow, share. I have to have discussions. I have to have dialogue. I have to take feedback. Again, I talk about Tim True and his coaching team all the time because they've been extremely helpful to me in my journey. But having that coach, that objective person that could come in and give you feedback. And so this all leads back to, I want to be that person that demonstrates and lives out this mindset in such a way that I actually invite other people. They're going to want more of that. They're going to want that feeling. They want to duplicate it in their, in their teams. So yeah, that's a lot. So we've talked about leading the team who reports to you. What do you do when there's resistant, resistance from your peers, from other senior management, other senior leadership? Uh, they're resisting. It's the same thing. You model it, right? Like, like if, 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 if you've got peers like on the leadership team that aren't, you know, living this out or they aren't buying into it, you've got to decide, is this a situation of will or skill? Are they not able to, or are they just not willing to? And clearly, if you set the culture and they're not willing to, they're sending a message to you that perhaps they're not as invested in the team as they need to be. Um, as far as senior management, you have to engage with people at the line level. This is such a challenge. Uh, most people that I talk to these days, especially in the public sector, uh, let me not say, let me, let me not say most, many leaders that I talk to at the strategic level, they're not prepared to lead at the strategic level. They're not even prepared to think strategically. My experience in law enforcement is, well, they promoted to the strategic level with no training. So, so we have to train them and, and help them understand that part of managing that is contact and engagement with all levels. So what I'm going to do at the, at the strategic level is I'm going to delegate some of my, my administrative work uh, to one level, one level down. And that does two things. That develops that person one level down to better understand my role and what they need to be doing if they want to advance. And then it also frees up time for me to visit the line level folks. So I can conduct stand-ups. I can get their opinions. I can take suggestions and act on them. Uh, you know, the, the staff, they're going to engage when they feel that you have their best interest at heart. Uh, you, you, you surface problems and you, and you apply quick fixes. 
I had a uh, I had a mentor named Karen, and Karen taught me that you know one of the first things you want to do is uncover a problem that you can fix for an employee and fix it. Uh, I had a team member, um, I'll call him Alan, uh, very disgruntled. I took over a new team. Alan comes into the office and he's kind of like a 25 year veteran, and he just was always so negative, very very uh, cynical, uh, small c cynical, and. Um, you know, I, I mean, he just came in almost like testing me. And he started ranting about the trash can out in the parking lot. He said, you know, you, you've got this edict that you want us to clean out the patrol cars before we turn them over to the next shift. But the trash can out in the parking lot, you know, you, you, you pull up there and you can't, you got to get out of the car to throw the trash away. You can't just pull up and just throw it away from within the car because the way the trash can sets. He says, you know, if we had one of those long neck trash cans we could pull right up we could put the trash in right and you can see alan's I mean, he's really right i mean he's he's kind of nitpicking there but guess what that's a problem i can solve i said alan great point let's get after that and so i call up my maintenance folks i have relationships with them they bring a forklift up they move the trash can from the front of the building to the back of the building and when the back of the building to the front of the building so they can put one of those caps on it problem solved it's too easy like it took like an hour my point is we want to actually identify issues they're having. Don't judge them. Solve them when you can solve them. Um, I think it's also good for, for the team to see that the leaders aren't above contributing at all levels. Like, like at, at some things, the organization should be flat around some things. So like maybe I'm a strategic leader, but you might see me emptying the trash when it needs to empty. Uh, you know, maybe, uh, maybe I'll work a teller window at a bank, even though I'm the bank branch manager. Uh, maybe I'll turn a wrench if I'm leading a fleet operations crew, or I'll actually make a sale if I'm leading a sales team. I think it's good for uh, senior leaders to get involved at that level. And I think we need to be intentional about stepping in and lending a hand now and then, but not become bogged down at that tactical level. Just uh, just, just visit it. Let them know that we're still capable and willing to do what we're asking them to do. Okay, Chip, I think we got time for one more question here. Oh, Can you discuss the Peter Principle? Uh, yeah. <laughs> so the Peter Principle is basically this concept that we are promoted to our level of incompetence. And so what that means is basically, um, I'm really good at my job. And so as a reward, they promote me. And then I'm really good at the next level. And as a reward, reward they promote me. And then I'm not so good, and they don't promote me. So what ends up happening is people within an organization, according to this principle, they end up being promoted to their level of incompetency. So the people are in roles that they're not very good at. And then what ends up happening to the organization? Uh, you know, a couple of things, right? Uh, one, those people will then respond by over-involving themselves at one level down. So I'm not comfortable being strategic. I'll drop back down to the operational level where I was at before, and I'll just work really hard at that level. I'll be a higher paid operational leader. Or at the operational level, I'll drop down to the tactical level. Now I'm a I'm an operational level leader that the tactical leaders are tripping over, right? Um, so, so this is a problem that, that we have to contend with. And I've seen people that I've seen do this really well. What they'll do is they'll promote me because of my potential. And then they'll hold my position for a probationary period, the position that I left. And if, if either one of us, me or the, the, the leadership team that's training and develop me, decide that I'm not able to meet that, to take on that additional responsibility, like now I have too much responsibility, they'll just simply move me back into the old position. No fuss, no muss. And it's accepted in that culture. That's a beautiful thing to build into. So there's one more thing, Sarah, and I'll, I'll try to keep this brief. We have to consider, and that's a derivation of the Pareto principle. It's called Price's Law. And Price's Law basically states that the 50% of the productive effort uh, in a particular work group um, the square root of the group is responsible for that 50%, meaning 50% of the work is done by the square root of that group. If you've got 10 people, three people are doing 50% of that effort. And that, that kind of, it doesn't compound, it kind of escalates linearly. So if you've got 100, it's 10. And, and you can Google and people can read about this idea of crisis law. If you're a manager, you should absolutely understand this law because it, it, it's something that tends to reoccur and we have to contend with it. And it's another challenge we have to face, but it's another reason why we want to be important. It's so important to be outward because we want to retain those high level performers, those people that the three out of 10, we want to keep those folks. And if we're, we're creating a culture of objectification, they're going to move on. 
and find something better to do uh, with their time. So, all right, again, with respect to time, Sarah, I'll kick it back over to you. All right, thanks, Chip. Um, you are speaking at Summit, if I'm not mistaken. You're gonna be one of our breakout sessions. Tell me more about that. Yeah. Are you excited, I'm all... you excited to come out? <laughs> yeah, oh, I'm super excited to come out. I mean, I love being with the Arbinger family in person. Uh, and I love interacting with the attendees. And I think we decided kind of uh, that I would talk a bit about how to kind of build relationships in the context of, of correcting uh, poor performance, which I, I'm excited to talk about that. I can't wait to be with, uh, be with the folks that are in attendance there. I am so excited too. It's going to be awesome. If you haven't signed up yet, I pulled up this slide, arbinger.com slash summit, Salt Lake City. August 22nd, if you are a facilitator, 23rd and 24th, but if you are an Arbinger facilitator, you can come on the 22nd. Um, Chip, uh, you've been to the summit a bunch of times. Is it is it all it sounds like it's gonna be? Let, let me tell you, Sarah, and, and I, I don't wanna get too hyperbolic here because everyone knows I'm all in when it comes to Arbinger. Arbinger saved my life, personally and professionally. But let me tell you, the thing I love about this experience is I'm not checking my phone. I'm not distracted. I'm not thinking about lunch. I am so engaged with the speakers. I'm so engaged with the people that are there. It's like the time flies by like that. Uh, I love it. I love it. It's so well done. And all the people, if you look, you're going to hear it plenty of times from the Arbinger staff, but everybody behind the scenes on our team that's making this happen and all of our keynote speakers that are coming in, uh, we owe you a huge debt of gratitude. So thank you for what you're doing to bring this together. I'm I'm so excited about it. And I'm so excited to get to see you in person. I That's know. gonna be great. We don't get I to know. do it. it's gonna be it's gonna be awesome. Um and some of the some of the things that we're not gonna be able to talk about, I have pages and pages of questions that we're not gonna get to, unfortunately. Some of those you are gonna be talking about in your breakout of the summit. So come see Chip in person, come shake his hand. I have seen him sign a few autographs. So maybe we'll hand you a Sharpie chip so that you can uh, you can sign some autographs. Yeah, wh whatever you think, Sarah. If anyone's asking for my autograph, I'm going to have to help them kind of recalibrate their expectations of celebrity. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and another thing I mentioned early on is some of these questions. And I, I mean, I'm showing you these pages, but there are so many more than this. You and I are going to connect. You've got some travel coming up. You and I are going to connect and answer some more of these questions doing a LinkedIn Live. So connect with Chip on LinkedIn. Follow Arbinger on LinkedIn so you can get a notification about that. Um, all of you who've attended today are going to get a copy of this recording. Please, I encourage you to forward it and share it to as many people as you think would benefit from it. And just my own biased opinion is I think everybody benefits from hearing, hearing from and learning from Chip. So thank you so much, Chip, for being here. Thank you, everybody who attended today. Look forward to seeing you in August at the summit.